Okay, well, um, yeah, I, I did slightly think it would be about sort of three people and a dog. So I prepared something that would be slightly more conversational and workshop in style. Um, so that's okay. You know, during the, during the talk, if people want to pitch in with what they think and what they know, that would be great. That's fine. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. I am, well, friends and family would freely describe me as a mental patient, given half a chance. Um, but I have actually also been a mental patient, uh, in that I've been in a psychiatric hospital. I've been in the Priory in Roehampton. I've been in the Meadows in Arizona. Uh, and this was back in 2009, when I had what would be conventionally referred to, I think, as a nervous breakdown. Um, <coughs> now, if you just ask someone, what is a nervous breakdown? How many people would have a really good sense that they would think, I know what that is? You kind of think you know what it means. If someone says to you, oh, my friend's having a breakdown, it kind of makes sense to you, doesn't it? It's just something you intuitively think, well, you know, this makes some sense. But it's also worth asking, well, wha what on earth does that really mean? Um, and that does get more complicated. Some people at the back, do you want to come and sit down, find seats? It's fine. I'm just rambling on about myself. I won't really be missing much. Um <coughs> So that was the beginning of my journey of, um, I guess, inquiry, of interest into the subject matter that we'll have a look at this morning. I found myself, um, was the, the events of my breakdown were triggered by financial problems in 2009. Um, not uncommon at that time, for people to have financial problems. But my reaction was quite uncommon in that I found it made me progressively more and more and more disabled and what you might call ill. Uh, so I eventually found my way to a psychiatrist who told me I had an anxiety disorder. Other people told me I was depressed. Um, I was told I was codependent. I had relationship disorders. I had overspending problems, under-earning problems. Um, I was, I had comorbidity, a dual diagnosis. Anyone got any more? <laughs> <coughs> you know, how many of us have heard all of these terms? And yeah, everyone. So then I found myself eventually in treatment in a small unit in Arizona, which was on the kind of back end of the Meadows campus, uh, which was called Melody House, which doesn't exist anymore. But it was a pioneering effort to do some aftercare with people they treat in their main addiction treatment center. Uh, related to what they call trauma. So we've all heard of trauma, I assume. Everyone's pretty familiar with that word. It's a buzzword in our, in our industries. Um, now, I hadn't really thought about having trauma. That was not one of the words that had been passed by me. Many others had. So I met the lady who ran it, and within minutes of meeting her, I thought she understood what was wrong with me. This is after about a year of thinking nobody understands what's wrong with me. So I began that process um, of being an uh, inpatient in that tiny aftercare clinic. And actually, it was the Chiron House, which I set up in 2011, um, really uh, initially was just an, an attempt to completely replicate every detail of that clinic in America, because it basically saved my life. Uh, and you know, I wasn't the only one. There were, I trying to think, there were probably about seven people I was there with during 10 weeks who said the same story, which is that they had basically despaired of ever getting well, and that they came to this place and they were either going to leave well or they were not going to leave. Put a euphemism on it. Um, and it was really transformational. And the, the interesting thing was that when I was there, what I was told was that now I have PTSD. That was a surprise, because I hadn't really been to war any time recently, or been in any car crashes, or it seemed very difficult to think of having PTSD. Do you want to come through, anyone who's um, struggling to find a chair, if you want a chair? Don't worry about interrupting. Sure. So I'm quite an inquisitive person, and... Uh, if for those of you who are clinicians, I'm the kind of awful client to have. And that one is always asking questions. I, you know, it's sort of 
Thursday afternoon and you're rolling through a session and you say something because you've heard it a thousand times and you think it's appropriate and the client says, but what does that actually mean? Does that happen to anyone? And you go, well, what does that actually mean? Well, what am I actually talking about? I've said this before, but do I know what I'm talking about? So I got very curious about uh, what was wrong with me and why and what all these things people were talking about meant. Um, and then, you know, I was lucky enough to be able to set up this facility, Chiron House, and worked with some amazing people. I've We've got some amazing staff, but also it gives me a chance to meet uh, you know, leaders in the field like Dr. Bessel van der Kolk and Janina Fisher and Stephen Porges, people know these names, um, you know, and learn and really learn from the pioneers in what I think is you know, broadly thought of as the trauma field. But even though I am a trained psychotherapist as well, um, I never lost the perspective of uh, what you might call the patient or the client or the resident or other names. Um, and that's always really been my focus. I've always thought it's really easy to wander around saying things like, oh, well, uh, you know, we do neurobiologically informed healthcare and that's going to really help you. Oh, great, you know, I'd love some of that. But it doesn't really mean anything to people. And I think about what it was like for me and my family and friends when I was really ill. And uh, none of these things really would have meant anything. Um, so that's enough boring stuff about me. I'm slightly curious about the people in the room. If it's just a quick show of hands so I can not take this talk totally in the wrong direction. Who's uh, what you might call a therapist or counsellor here who works with clients? Okay. And who would identify as somebody who's in treatment or in recovery or, uh, if you like, a, a client or patient, someone in my category? Not some? Okay, not so many. And is anyone uh, in medicine, doctors, nurses, etc.? Okay, all right. So lots of people familiar with working with clients, um, and that's what I was hoping for. <coughs> because the one of the problems that I think we have as a kind of community helping people is that there is a bit of a disconnect between, if you like, the expert and the, the person who is uh, in need of expertise. And we struggle with this a lot in our residential community because we think, okay, this is a community, this is people together, <coughs> people ha helping each other together. How do we avoid becoming a, a kind of people apart, if you like? Because people, you know, clients come and pay for expertise, but they don't come to pay to be treated as a separate class of, of species, if I can put it like that. Can you relate to that? I mean, is, is this one of the difficulties? And yet, when you're a clinician, you do have expertise, you do have knowledge, and you are trying to help, and it is nerve-wracking, and it is difficult. And it's sometimes difficult to cross that bridge, and it's sometimes easy to sit back behind a kind of buffer of expertise to feel a little bit, uh, I don't know, a little bit protected from the difficulty of the work. I mean, maybe it's just me, but is that something people can relate to? That you know, sometimes it's hard to remember that in a way we're all on the same path that just some people have left on an earlier train. I sometimes think about it. And Chiron House, I don't know if you know, but Chiron is the Greek myth of the wounded healer. This name was suggested to me when we opened, and I just thought it's really important to, for me anyway, to remember that uh, the, you know, there's no difference between the healer and the wounded, in a way. So um, the invisible lion is a, really comes out of a I find myself in consultations with people over and over again using the same metaphors. So I started to try to codify them and put them into some sort of order. Now, if you think about walking down the street and you see someone um, behaving like this, how do, you, how do you feel about this person? What do you think about this person? Let's say, you know, you probably read the blurb on this, so this is a bit redundant, but... There he is. It just looks like a crazy person. You can see how easily someone could look at somebody in that situation and say, they look crazy to me. And this is how I was in 2009. Everyone telling me what was wrong with me, what I needed. But you bring the lion into focus and just intuitively it's a different response, isn't it? So really everything I, I do in the work that I try to um, do now is to try to change that to that for the audience, if you like, to try to understand if it's me, if I'm inside the mind of that person running, I want to be able to understand that picture 
And if you're a clinician, you might want to explain it. So it does bring up the question of uh, where all these things come from. So there's four things that I can talk to you about today. One is kind of where how the Lyme was born, where it comes from. Another is what it looks like to be in that syndrome. Another is what it feels like. And the third is uh, how we put the lion to sleep. <coughs> you may or may not be interested in different bits of that. Um, we can speed up or slow down if anyone cries out and says, please tell me more, or I even more depressingly, if people say, please tell me less, that's mm -hmm. also allowed. And if you get hot or bored or just can't take it anymore, it's fine to leave. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. Um, so really, the, the way that the, the lion was born, the lion is a metaphor for dysregulation in the system of each person. So really, what's going on when you think about there being a lion in the room is that there, there is a real threat, but it's not here right now. And in a way, that's what you know, this buzzword trauma refers to. It refers to something has happened which was stressful enough to put a big tax on the response to threat. Um, and that response is not yet finished, but the actual event is no longer literally occurring. Uh, and so that's what we have to think about. We have to think about really the complexity of the stress response. Now the stress response, uh, you know, we could do all morning about the evolution of the stress response, but only partially interesting, but it basically works like this. You begin with um, very simple mammal or fish-like organi organisms, and they start to evolve into more complicated responses to threat. And the reason for this, and this is the reason why it's so fundamental to everything that we look at in the consulting room, is that how you respond to threat determines whether or not you survive. I mean, on a basic level, if you're in the system of predation and prey, if you're a deer and there's a lion around, how you respond to the lion being around determines whether or not you have any baby deer, which determines whether or not the next generation is adept at responding to threat, and so on and so on and so on. So the nature of evolution is that it rewards organisms that develop more complicated and successful ways to respond to threat. It's something we don't often don't think about. But every single person in this room and every single person you treat are the result of millions of years of that sifting process try to figure out which of these organisms are going to respond most successfully to threat. Um, unfortunately, in my opinion, we've become like a supercomputer where you've loaded on so many programs and trying to get it better and better, that actually it's stopped being able to really do it at all. Okay. And this is the problem we're going to have a look at. Um, so just to break this down, I don't know if anyone's seen me talk about this before, but the normal response to threat, is what we would call uh, a stress cycle, <laughs> is simply to become a little bit agitated and use that agitation to remove yourself or to solve the threatening situation and then to recover. Okay? So this is a basic stress cycle. You might have this going on if you're in the kitchen and you're doing the washing up and someone behind you drops a bowl and it shatters. Okay? Everyone can relate to this? You get a little bit agitated, then you realize it's fine, and, and it all goes away. Um, and to put a little bit more into it, you've got a thing called a sympathetic nervous system, which is a physical part of your body, uh, which will, will generate a charge, generate some energy in it, some tone, I sometimes call it. And that is the thing that then changes your biochemistry and makes you ready to do something about threats. So if you're lying on the sofa and someone drops a bowl, your body will react, this is what's going on. Um, now, the problem, the complexity in it comes when the threat starts to become overwhelming. Now, if you think about, just if I just take you back to the kind of primordial swamp, let's say you've got a school of fish who've learned to run away from predators. Um, and predators have then learned to develop very good vision for moving fish. And what would be a really great way to become the next generation of fish in that situation? Stand still. Stand still, yeah, to freeze. So if everyone's running and the sharks are really good at catching running fish and you suddenly develop this paralysis, you're going to be in really good shape. 
Um, I mean, it doesn't quite work like that in evolution, but you get, you get how the, the picture is built. So one of the things that we notice in, uh, in mammals and in fish and birds is that there's a kind of cutoff point to the excitation of a response to threat. So you get really, 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 really stressed on your, it's probably a fight-flight pathway <laughs> on the way up. And you hit what we might call a red line. It's just like a circuit breaker in a domestic electric supply. It just cuts off. And you can see there's really good videos you can find on YouTube, things like gazelles just kind of freezing. And you might have seen some of these things before in training videos and things. You can find some links. Um, but what you'll find is a mammal will just go into freeze, and that happens. Okay? So instead of this smooth up and down, you get an interrupted smooth up and down. It's like watching a DVD at home, and you're in the middle of uh, Die Hard, and Bruce Willis is just about to jump out the window, and the doorbell goes. And you press pause, and it's Jehovah's Witness, and you can have a long chat, and they take you to their mothership, and you're gone for 20 years, and you come home, you come back to the room and think, what was I doing? And you look at the TV and there's Bruce Willis frozen on the screen. You press play and boom, it all comes back. This is really what's going on here. At some point, if you survive the, the stress and the threat, your system will kick back, it will unfreeze, and you'll discharge. Now, that's fine. You know, mammals do this all the time. So far, we've not, we're not talking about anything that's problematic. We'll get, none of these mammals would end up in the consulting room with you. They're all good. They're back at the watering hole. 90 seconds later, it's all over. Uh, but what you see is that you're now introducing, you see, this, it's quite difficult to do this in two dimensions because it looks like it just goes back to a kind of resting place, but it doesn't. What it does is it brings in a whole load of potential stored energy into a system which is waiting to release it. So really, that's a slightly better diagram. Now just putting a bit of uh, action on this, you've got a gazelle. <laughs> yeah. That's the green thing is a gazelle. <laughs> <coughs> and I did draw these myself, so <laughs> be kind. Uh, the gazelle sees a lion mooching around and starts to leg it. The lion is about to eat the gazelle. The gazelle freezes. The lion gets distracted. There's a really good, I should have brought this video, there's a really good example of this, um, which has been adopted by a website called Thug Life. Has anyone heard of Thug Life? It's nothing to do with mental health. Um, but you can see a lion about to eat, I think, a gazelle, who then gets distracted by a hyena, who is the thug. And then, while the lion's distracted, the hyena gets up and runs off. And that's actually what happens next. The next thing you know, uh, sorry, the, the gazelle gets up and runs off. And then it'll be back at the waterhole, and the nervous system will twitch and shake, and they prance, and they contract, and then they're good. It's all fine. So, just looking at these boxes, I wonder if you can see where the human mammal might begin to have fallen from this wonderful state of evolved happiness. Which of the boxes, compared with the graph underneath it, actually wouldn't make sense if you were able to observe yourself in the box? And I'm putting forward the idea that the, the difference in a human and other animals is self-awareness. And you can, you can say, oh, maybe not right. But in general, that's a reasonably good approximation. <coughs> I'd say four. You'd say four. Okay, tell me more about four. Would you like a microphone? No. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, so excited. So excited. Yeah, okay. So what's wrong with four? What's wrong with four? Because the humans don't do the, the recharging. They don't do the mm -hmm. shaking out and the yeah. Well, you're exactly right. And you see, the problem is, if you're in box four and you're human, you actually see box four. Right? You don't just do it, you see it. And what you see is no lion. But your body is doing the opposite of fight and flight, which looks exactly the same as fight and flight, just in reserve. So all the energy is coming out rather than going in. But there's nothing there to run away from. So you're the guy at the beginning that is trying to discharge all this energy and what happens when you are behaving like you're running away from a lion, but there's no lion? What's the feedback you get from yourself and others? Something wrong with you. Something wrong with you, yeah. So you'll notice that in the kind of arsenal of treatment, we have external and internal ways of intervening on people uh, telling themselves there's something wrong with them. So on the outside, we try to help them. But we also, the, you know, the CBT revolution is about trying to say to someone, well, maybe you should stop 
thinking like that and just let stuff be. It's not really designed for this. But you can see how internally and externally there's a consequence to uh, following something that's been organically developing over millions of years and now seems to be problematic when you add in this thing of self-awareness. Um, now, I'm not putting myself forward as some kind of theologian here, but it often strikes me as interesting that the first story in the Bible is about the fall from the Garden of Eden, and the, the catalytic engine for that is something very close to uh, the dawn of self-awareness. This idea of the eating from the tree of the fruit of knowledge. You become, I think Adam becomes self-aware and then he's ashamed, and then the, the kind of harmony of Eden is lost. It's really the same thing here. You, know, you become self-aware, the harmony of a discharge and re-regulation and the thing they call homeostasis, which you come back to the same place in your body, is lost. And it's replaced with this. So when I was having a nervous breakdown, that blue thing on the right was my home, basically. And I realized this eventually after I figured this out, that I wasn't really like anxious like like this morning, I was a bit anxious. I was thinking, oh, I've got to do this talk. I wonder if anyone will come. I wonder if loads of people will come. I wonder what will happen. I wonder if I'll remember anything. I wonder if it'll go on too long. I wonder if it'll be too short. <laughs> that was just <laughs> me being anxious. But this, this is when your body, if you like, is being anxious. And this is what put me in hospital. So here, here if you look on the right, the squiggly line is the system's trying to release and then me or someone else tells me that's mad, I can't do it. Push it back in. It's coming out, it's coming back in, it's coming out, coming back in. And of course, after you know, four decades of not being able to do this anyway, you don't get very good at it. Even though, it turns out, the body never loses its capacity to do this. So I was helped in treatment to allow these things to complete. And that's why I'm able to stand here today and talk to you. And really, all that was done, I mean not to belittle what was done, but what was done was to someone helped my mammal, the mammal in me, just to get on with what it knows how to do. Um, so what happens, instead of going from charge to discharge, you go from charge to freaking out, to trying to settle down, to still being charged. Okay? And that's not very helpful. Interestingly, look, look what's appeared. Please, someone say it's the invisible lion. <laughs> It's the invisible lion, isn't it? Thank you. That's <laughs> such a good drawing. You couldn't not say that. Um, <laughs> so if I'm running all the time and there is no lion, then I, have to I actually have to start to believe there's a lion or see a lion. Otherwise, I would really be worried about myself. Now, has anyone ever found anyone else to be somewhat more of a problem than maybe they were? when they were just a little bit upset or worried. I mean, has anyone in this room ever thought that maybe in retrospect they were just thinking someone else was a bit more of a threat than they had to? Yeah, well, th there you go. That's a perfect picture of you. Perfect diagram. This is what we do. We, we end up dysregulated, and dysregulation requires that there is a problem, otherwise we're the problem and we don't like being the problem. Um, so you can see that this is really, you remember where we were in that lovely smooth thing up and down, the river of life, Peter Levine calls it, it's all good. This is what you end up with instead. You end up with a dysregulated system, a real threat in the past, um, and a phantom threat in the present, which is related to the past, but we see them the same. So you might marry your mother, and then you might decide that your wife is just like your mother. It, she may or may not be, but you're certainly going to be placing a lot more of the phantom on her than is there in the room. So we all do this all the time, and it's really it's basically what, are, what drives most of our behavior, relationships, families, villages, society, politics even. You think about politics now, well, there's just imaginary lines left and right, aren't there? Otherwise, why would everyone be so violently disagreeing in different directions? Um, the, the difficulty in this, and why it makes people feel really, really quite, um, quite unsettled to the point of uh, needing to do something about it, and we'll get on to talking about addiction later, I promise, um, 
But you've got three parts of the brain. You've got the human, mammal, and reptile. Again, this is part of evolution. Uh, the mammal suppresses part of the reptile system. The human suppresses part, part of the mammal system. And like on your laptop, these things are supposed to work together and get on. Um, so on your laptop, you've got a thing called a BIOS, which is the tiny little circuit that tells the computer if you've pressed the on button or not. That's it. So that's like your reptile brain. Then you've probably got Windows or Apple or something, which is the operating system, like the mammal system, which basically just m you know, makes it hang together. And then you've got your specialist functions like Excel or Photoshop. And those are your, that's your human supercomputer cool stuff. Now, as you know, you load enough stuff on a computer and it doesn't work. Um, so here we've got a situation where the mammal and the reptile brain are going in one direction, the human brain is going in another direction. And basically that feels like you are kind of going mad or cracking up. So it's much better for the human brain to say, actually, you know what, I only feel like this because you're a complete arsehole. <laughs> no, no, you really are a complete arsehole. And I'm going to carry on convincing of you that forever so I can feel okay. Has anyone ever done that? <laughs> Just me? Oh, okay, fine. <laughs> um, <coughs> so let's see what that does to... Uh, exactly what we were talking about, the behaviour of people who <laughs> behave like me. Um, so th this is a, uh, all of these things you can have, by the way, if you want these slides. Um, we've got a stand, Kyron House. If you just give your card or email address to Romana, I'll send you a copy of this. Because what I'm trying to do is give you something that you could maybe print out and show to a client and look at together and say, you know, what do you think of this? Or is this interesting to you? Or does this help either of us make sense of you? This is, this is me, this is the client. Okay, so this is the dysregulated human. Um, and what the red squiggle represents is that charge. Right? So you've got something there that's not yet settled. And what happens in life is that you, things happen. Right? Stuff just happens, keeps happening. I try, to, I try to iron it out, but it just keeps happening. Things keep coming at my system, which isn't perfectly settled. And that's the reaction, okay? So does that make sense to everyone here? This is a really, this is kind of the heart of the model for me, for a client. Just, just tell me if anyone feels that this is a confusing piece. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm just wondering if you could explain that to me a little bit. Is that like where you're internalising yourself? Well, what's happening is your system is trying to finish a response to a threat from an earlier time. So I might want to run away. My legs might feel like running, even though I'm having a hug. And so what I'm actually doing is bringing in the energy that belongs to something I can't see right now. And because I can see both of those things, I can see that there's nothing wrong in the room and I can see that my legs want to run. I can, the only way I can make sense of that is to say I'm nuts. No, rather than acknowledge the reality of what's yeah. really happening. Yeah, but the whole point of this psychoeducation is to change that. So the primary goal, actually, of this talk for clients is that they can stop having that reaction. They can just say, I'm having a strong reaction. It must be from something before and that makes perfect sense. Uh, I'll get to that at the end, I hope. <laughs> um, so in the meantime, what happens is this is how people behave. And dare I say, I think this is how everybody behaves. You know, to a greater or lesser extent, um, everybody, maybe you know, one, ten percent of this planet don't, but everybody is, if you like, having responses to things which are exaggerated based on the reality of what's happening right now. So does that make sense? The whole thing at the beginning is really about how a system becomes dysregulated. And this is about what dysregulated people look like in the real world. So the other thing that happens is that people freeze, people shut down. So we're, we're all familiar with people who are overreactive and people who are underreactive. Okay? Do you see that in the consulting room? Is that a, you know, you're always trying to get people either to calm down a bit or wake up a bit, you know, do something about it or stop doing so much about it. Is that fairly familiar dynamic. 
Uh, I'm just going to go with the model on the right because it's actually just easier to work with. I mean, you probably know it's easier to work with. It's easier to work with in theory as well, but it goes both ways. Um, but the problem is, in this lecture, we can look at that, right? And we see a three-stage process. We see, we see a trigger, we see the baggage, and we see a reaction. And then it makes sense. But, but if you're in the queue at the post office, this is what you see. Okay? You see someone who you bump into slightly, who then rips your head off. And you don't see the baggage, because you're not in their timeline. You don't know their life. You don't know them. You don't know anything. You just see that, and that's not very pleasant the easy thing to be around. Okay? So we're all familiar with that. Um, what you want is you want to look like this. Okay? This is somebody with no baggage at all. Same stimulus, proportionate reaction. Now when you think about working with clients with boundaries, etc., th there must be a big sense in which you're looking at people and helping people to understand and for them to learn and understand what, what reaction to this is proportionate. You know, if I'm, if I'm really shut down, am I doing too little? If I'm really explosive, am I doing too much? And the problem is that what we, what we see of uh, the problem of dysregulation is we see relationships, okay? So, so much of the work around addiction has become work around relationship. S is that fairly, fairly common? You think about codependency or love addiction, I all these kind of things come out of um, the work of uh, addiction recovery. <laughs> Much was done by Pia Melody at, at the Meadows, but many other people as well. And you can begin to see why relationships might be difficult if people are dysregulated. So in this case, on the left you've got a person, on the right you've got a person, both are dysregulated. And what's happening is that the person on the right who creates the first green arrow and says something like, Sweetheart, where did you leave the toothpaste? Okay, and Sweetheart says, F you, I've already done a million things this morning and your mother's a twat. <laughs> <laughs> and person B then throws um, a chair across the kitchen and storms out and says, I hate you, I'm never coming back. That all happens, how long does that take? Who said a minute? I want that relationship. <laughs> Yes, seconds if you're lucky, you know, maybe you know, up to a second. Once you really get good at it, you can do this pretty <laughs> fast. Okay. So we're all fairly familiar with that. So this is, th you think about it, you're starting with the problem of evolution. Then you've got a problem of, yes, some threatening things happen in life, because they do. Uh, some of them are overwhelming, which we would call trauma. Those are not recovered from, so you're dysregulated. So then you're jumpy or frozen all the time. And then you're still trying to get on with people. You're still trying to have families, you're still trying to have relationships, you're still trying to have co-workers. How well is that going to work out? Now, I'm, I'm going to give you a bit of hope now, and inject a bit of hope. Let's say that you can begin to wrap around this process of dysregulation something which has a little bit of recovery in it. Okay, so you can recover the system a bit. Look what might happen. So let's look at the blue um, orb as a kind of bubble of recovery. You've got the stimulus that comes in, and you can just hold a bit of that at bay. Right? And this is your, your boundary work, in a way. Still got your reaction, but you can even hold a bit of your reaction in, which is like containment. So you, you know, you're holding a bit of yourself from the world and yourself from the world. And the result is, miraculously, look at the red arrow down there. looks just like that one. So even though you're dysregulated, it doesn't mean it's impossible to be in the world in a regulated way. It just takes a bit of work. And I'm sure there's a lot of people in this room who are familiar with doing that work, right? And who can relate to life before doing the work and life after doing the work. And after doing the work, the world is a bit easier to get on with, isn't it? Okay. Now I think of this model as a therapy session. So I've got a therapist on the left who yeah, they've learned about themselves, they've done a bit of work, and they, they have some boundaries in containment. You've still got a client on the right. The question is, how does this relationship go? This relationship, how long does it last? I'll put it another way. Where do these two people organically want to go? If this was an animated slide, where would they be moving? 
They'd be moving apart, yeah. And what happens when they get really far apart? They get bored and they come back together. And they keep going. Uh, this one, how does this one work? <laughs> Works okay for a bit, right? This is kind of like an hour in therapy. You know, you can, you can tolerate this, and there's a little bit of argy-bargy, but as long as everyone knows that this is a... This is a, a, a limited thing. You can, you can. This is this is survival. This is the the beginning of relationship, if you like. Um, it would be overwhelming for the person on the left to be like this for ages and ages and ages, and the person on the right gets to experience a bit of safety because they're knocking on the door, but it's not falling down. Um, so, two people with a bit of recovery, you can get more into a balanced relationship where. Okay, neither of them is perfect, neither of them is regulated, neither of them is like uh, you know, a guru on top of a mountain, but they can, with the work, begin to be able to be in a functional relationship together. So you guys know about you know, all sorts of different ways that clinical trainings put forward these ideas, but this is the way I would explain the root of that, just looking at nervous system and e evolution. Um, so this is a good place to be, and you can hang out there for a long time. This is, this is where we want to be. So at the end of a 12-step meeting, you might have a room full of people who feel like this. And how good does that feel? Who goes to 12-step meetings here? Okay, so you know that, I, that you, can, you, know you can come out of a meeting and say, that was a great meeting. <coughs> and really, I think that is another way of saying, I feel like that. Okay? I went in there feeling like that. And I came out feeling like that. And the difference is, because people behave like this, right? So this is why I say, that, you know, what does the line look like? The line looks like behavior. You, you can see dysregulation in the world through the way people behave. And if you had no other goal in mental health or behavioral health treatment, it is to recover and simulate that kind of behavior. You know, you talk about fake it until you make it. I think that's what it means. Um, so, imagine you're young, you get dysregulated because life happens and you're a human mammal, which means your nervous system doesn't re recover, and you try and have relationships because you're in a family and you're young, and you have caregivers who've been doing this for the last 40 years, and it's not going to be that easy, right? So you might be in a family like that, or like that, or like that. And funnily enough, if you just put together these different ideas and think, well, you know, in theory, what would that give you? Imagine a child with an exploding nervous system. You'd become avoidant. You, you know, you'd want to retreat from that nervous system. Or a child with a frozen nervous system, the that box there, which we don't really talk about so much, but the one on the left is frozen. Um, you just want more and more and more, don't you, if you're that child? And if you're a child with somebody who does both, then that's just really disorganizing. You might call it traumatic attachment if it's really extreme. Um, but if you grow up and that's your mummy, or your daddy, or your granny, or your caregiver, you might end up with a regulated attachment. Now, Bowlby discovered these attachment styles. Right? But these, these, these ideas come organically, logically, out of what we've been talking about. If everything we were saying wasn't true, then you wouldn't expect it to predict things which you can see. <coughs> but it appears to be pretty straightforward and clear that you just start with self-awareness interrupting a mammalian response that's been evolved over many years. The next thing you know, you're coming out with attachment theory. So I find this quite encouraging as a way to understand myself, because I have a bit of that kind of scientific mind. I like to think that about things that make sense. Now, supercomputer, cool stuff. Now, as you know, you load enough stuff on a computer and it doesn't work. Um, so here we've got a situation where the mammal and the reptile brain are going in one direction, the human brain is going in another direction. And basically that feels like you are kind of going mad or cracking up. So it's much better for the human brain to say, Actually, you know what, I only feel like this because you're a complete arsehole. <laughs> no, no, you really are a complete arsehole. And I'm going to carry on convincing of you that forever, so I can feel okay. Has anyone ever done that? <laughs> Just me? Oh, okay, fine. <laughs> um, <coughs> so let's see what that does to uh, exactly what we were talking about.
behavior of people who <laughs> behave like me. Um, so th this is a, uh, all of these things you can have, by the way, if you want these slides. Um, we've got a stand, Kyron House. If you just give your card or email address to Romana, I'll send you a copy of this. Because what I'm trying to do is give you something that you could maybe print out and show to a client and look at together and say, you know, what do you think of this? Or is this interesting to you? Or does this help either of us make sense of you? This is, this is me. This is the client. Okay, so this is the dysregulated human. Um, and what the red squiggle represents is that charge. Right? So you've got something there that's not yet settled. And what happens in life is that you things happen. Right? Stuff just happens, keeps happening. I try, to, I try to iron it out, but it just keeps happening. Things keep coming at my system, which isn't perfectly settled. And that's the reaction. Okay? So does that make sense to everyone here? This is a really, this is kind of the heart of the model for me, for a client. Just, just tell me if anyone feels that this is a confusing piece. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just wondering if you could explain that to me a little bit. Is that like where you're internalizing yourself? Well, what's happening is your system is trying to finish a response to a threat from an earlier time. So I might want to run away. My legs might feel like running, even though I'm having a hug. And so what I'm actually doing is bringing in the energy that belongs to something I can't see right now. And because I can see both of those things, I can see that there's nothing wrong in the room and I can see that my legs want to run. I can, the only way I can make sense of that is to say I'm nuts. No, rather than acknowledge the reality of what's yeah. really happening. Yeah, but the whole point of this psychoeducation is to change that. So the primary goal, actually, of this talk for clients is that they can stop having that reaction. They can just say, I'm having a strong reaction. It must be from something before and that makes perfect sense. Uh, I'll get to that at the end, I hope. <laughs> um, so in the meantime, what happens is this is how people behave. And dare I say, I think this is how everybody behaves. You know, to a greater or lesser extent, um, everybody, maybe you know, one, ten percent of this planet don't, but everybody is, if you like, having responses to things which are exaggerated based on the reality of what's happening right now. So does that make sense? The whole thing at the beginning is really about how a system becomes dysregulated. And this is about what dysregulated people look like in the real world. So the other thing that happens is that people freeze, people shut down. So we're, we're all familiar with people who are overreactive and people who are underreactive. Okay? Do you see that in the consulting room? Is that a, you know, you're always trying to get people either to calm down a bit or wake up a bit, you know, do something about it or stop doing so much about it. Is that fairly familiar dynamic. Uh, I'm just going to go with the model on the right because it's actually just easier to work with. I mean, you probably know it's easier to work with. It's easy to work with in theory as well, but it goes both ways. Um, but the problem is, in this lecture, we can look at that, right? And we see a three-stage process. We see, we see a trigger, we see the baggage, and we see a reaction. And then it makes sense. But if you're in the queue at the post office, this is what you see, okay? You see someone who you bump into slightly who then rips your head off. And you don't see the baggage because you're not in their timeline. You don't know their life. You don't know them. You don't know anything. You just see that, and that's not a very pleasant, the easy thing to be around, okay? So we're all familiar with that. Um, what you want is you want to look like this. This is somebody with no baggage at all, same stimulus, proportionate reaction. Now, when you think about working with clients with boundaries, etc., th there must be a big sense in which you're looking at people and helping people to understand, and for them to learn and understand, what, what reaction to this is proportionate. You know, if I'm, if I'm really shut down, am I doing too little? If I'm really explosive, am I doing too much? And the problem is that what we, what we see of 
the problem of dysregulation is we see relationships, okay? So, so much of the work around addiction has become work around relationship. S is that fairly, fairly common? You, know, you think about codependency or love addiction, I all these kind of things come out of um, the work of uh, addiction recovery. <laughs> much were done by Pia Melody at, at the Meadows, but many other people as well. And you can begin to see why relationships might be difficult if people are dysregulated. So in this case, on the left you've got a person, on the right you've got a person, both are dysregulated. And what's happening is that the person on the right who creates the first green arrow and says something like, sweetheart, where did you leave the toothpaste? Okay, and sweetheart says, F you, I've already done a million things this morning and your mother's a twat. <laughs> <laughs> and person B then throws um, a chair across the kitchen and storms out and says, I hate you, I'm never coming back. That all happens, how long does that take? Who said a minute? I want that relationship. <laughs> yes, seconds if you're lucky, you know, maybe you know, up to a second. Once you really get good at it, you can do this pretty <laughs> fast. Okay. So we're all fairly familiar with that. So this is, th you think about it, you're starting with the problem of evolution. Then you've got a problem of, yes, some threatening things happen in life, because they do. Uh, some of them are overwhelming, which we would call trauma. Those are not recovered from, so you're dysregulated. So then you're jumpy or frozen all the time. And then you're still trying to get on with people. You're still trying to have families. You're still trying to have relationships. You're still trying to have co-workers. How well is that going to work out? Now, I'm, I'm going to give you a bit of hope now, and inject a bit of hope. Let's say that you can begin to wrap around this process of dysregulation something which has a little bit of recovery in it. Okay, so you can recover the system a bit. Look what might happen. So let's look at the blue um, orb as a kind of bubble of recovery. You've got the stimulus that comes in, and you can just hold a bit of that at bay. Right? And this is your, your boundary work, in a way. Still got your reaction, but you can even hold a bit of your reaction in, which is like containment. So you, you know, you're holding a bit of yourself from the world and yourself from the world. And the result is, miraculously, look at the red arrow down there, looks just like that one. So even though you're dysregulated, it doesn't mean it's impossible to be in the world in a regulated way. It just takes a bit of work. And I'm sure there's a lot of people in this room who are familiar with doing that work, right? and who can relate to life before doing the work and life after doing the work. And after doing the work, the world is a bit easier to get on with, isn't it? Okay. Now I think of this model as a therapy session. So I've got a therapist on the left who, yeah, they've learned about themselves, they've done a bit of work and they, they have some boundaries and containment. You've still got a client on the right. The question is, how does this relationship go? This relationship, how long does it last? I'll put it another way, where do these two people organically want to go? If this was an animated slide, where would they be moving? Apart. They'd be moving apart, yeah. And what happens when they get really far apart? They get bored and they come back together. And they keep going. Uh, this one, how does this one work? works okay for a bit, right? This is kind of like an hour in therapy. You know, you can, you can tolerate this, and there's a little bit of argy-bargy, but as long as everyone knows that this is a, this is a, a, a limited thing, you can, you can, this, is, this is survival. This is the, the beginning of relationship, if you like. Um, it would be overwhelming for the person on the left to be like this for ages and ages and ages. And the person on the right gets to experience a bit of safety because they're knocking on the door, but it's not falling down. Um, so two people with a bit of recovery, you can get more into a balanced relationship where, okay, neither of them is perfect, neither of them is regulated, neither of them is like uh, you know, a guru on top of a mountain, but they can, with the work, begin to be able to be in a functional relationship together. So you guys know about you know, all sorts of different ways that clinical trainings put forward these ideas, but this is the way I would explain the root of that just looking at nervous system and e evolution. Um, so this is a good place to be, and you can hang out there for a long time. Right? This, is, this is where we want to be. So at the 
end of a 12-step meeting, you might have a room full of people who feel like this. And how good does that feel? Who goes to 12-step meetings here? Okay, so you know that, I, that you, can, you know you can come out of a meeting and say, that was a great meeting. <coughs> and really, I think that is another way of saying, I feel like that. Okay? I went in there feeling like that. And I came out feeling like that. And the difference is <coughs> because people behave like this. Right? So this is why I say, that, you know, what does the line look like? The line looks like behavior. You, you can see dysregulation in the world through the way people behave. And if you had no other goal in mental health or behavioral health treatment, it is to recover and simulate that kind of behavior. You know, talk about fake it until you make it. I think that's what it means. Um, so imagine you're young, you get dysregulated because life happens and you're a human mammal, which means your nervous system doesn't re recover. And you try and have relationships because you're in a family and you're young. And you have caregivers who've been doing this for the last 40 years and it's not going to be that easy. Right? So you might be in a family like that or like that or like that. And funnily enough, if you just put together these different ideas and think, well, you know, in theory, what would that give you? Imagine a child with an exploding nervous system, you'd become avoidant. You, you know, you'd want to retreat from that nervous system. Or a child with a frozen nervous system, the that box there, which we don't really talk about so much, but the one on the left is frozen. Um, you just want more and more and more, don't you, if you're that child? And if you're a child with somebody who does both, then that's just really disorganizing. You might call it traumatic attachment if it's really extreme. Um, but if you grow up and that's your mummy, or your daddy, or your granny, or your caregiver, you might end up with a regulated attachment. Now, Bowlby discovered these attachment styles. Right? But these, these, these ideas come organically, logically, out of what we've been talking about. If everything we were saying wasn't true, then you wouldn't expect it to predict things which you can see. <coughs> but it appears to be pretty straightforward and clear that you just start with self-awareness interrupting a mammalian response that's been evolved over many years. The next thing you know, you're coming out with attachment theory. So I find this quite encouraging as a way to understand myself, because I have a bit of that kind of scientific mind. I like to think about things that make sense. Now I know a lot of clients aren't like that. They like, if you like, a bit more phenomenological. They like the, you know, Pia Melody's work is, is very interesting because she sort of observes behavior and records it and decodes it like a psychologist. But there's another way of talking to people that can give them an idea that, actually, why wouldn't I be like this? And for me, that was a big moment. When you think, okay, so all those things people tell me are so awful about myself are actually just a result of evolution. And maybe there's, you know, it doesn't mean I'm not responsible for my behavior, but maybe I don't have to feel so ashamed about it all the time. And I think in addiction recovery, that can be a huge help to be able to say to someone, okay, so you know, these things have gone wrong and this behavior happened and people are upset. But maybe, just maybe, you're dysregulated because evolution has just fallen off the rails. And a lot of people are, and it's not necessarily a personality failing. It could just be part of your biochemical complexity. Um, and you know, if you want to get into attachment styles, etc., that's great. So you, you can see all these things everywhere in real life. If you think about attachment styles and you think about these behavioral patterns, so far, we're just looking at one-on-one, -on -one, right? First of all, you look at sort of one person on their own with this regulation. Then you look at two people. And you think about a mother, a child, or a relationship, or, you know, maybe a co-worker. But imagine, imagine this room. Imagine if we took this room and we went to an island, and we spent three months together on that island, and we're all doing something of all of this. How would that end up working out? What, what would our community look like? How would we survive that? So we can't survive on our own. That doesn't work. So we have to find some way to remain in community and in relationship, even though none of our relationships work properly. How would we do that? And it turns out that there's some really nice theory that's come out of um, sensory motor psychotherapy, which is a kind of trauma 
attachment treatment psychotherapy, which has elaborated on taking, uh, if you like, the, the child attachment styles into adulthood and seeing how, how far can you push the complexity of adaptation effectively. Because you know, all of this is about adapting from who you really would have been. I don't know if anyone can recognize themselves in this list. Would anyone like to volunteer what is their character strategy? Oh, I left out completely perfect at the bottom for <laughs> <coughs> those of you who <laughs> want to just adopt that. I've been reliably labeled charming manipulative by uh, people who work for me who are experts in this. So I'm probably not going to disagree with them. I think it's quite, I was quite flattered by that. <laughs> <laughs> not, th not the second bit, but. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and it's all in a way a, a positive negative. So you might become charming so that you can get the things you need in life, but the reason you do it is because you're too afraid to say I need something. Yeah? Okay, so you got one. Yay! <laughs> I'm not the only one who's not perfect in the room. It's perfect. Um, and, that, and this is the way it is. So if you're that child that is avoidant or disorganized or anxious, you might find a new way to be an adult, which is not going to be to cry or you're not going to be doing child things anymore. You're going to be in an office. You're 35 years old. You've got to find another way. Um, so if you're afraid to say, I really need help, you might go up to someone and say, that's such a beautiful blouse you're wearing this morning. <laughs> oh, thank you. And then, you know, I'm going to do this. So, uh, tough, generous, you know, again, that sounds good, doesn't it? Industrious, over-focused, that could be good. I'm a hard worker. Um, expressive, clinging, it could be really expressive. But you know, all of these things obviously have a shadow side, and you can get them in pairs and et cetera, et cetera. It's a great body of work by Pat Ogden and others. But really, again, it's taking this same idea of you've got a mammal, it gets self-aware, it meets a lion, it doesn't quite recover, its nervous system is dysregulated, then it has a mummy and a daddy and a sister and a brother and they're all dysregulated and it's trying to figure out how to cope with boarding school. Sorry, I stopped talking about myself at some point. <laughs> um, and then it develops one of these. Okay? Um, but you have to, I, you think about how complicated people are and how complicated societal relationships are. You've got to get more complex in your response than just to cry or give up. Right? Well, someone's laughing. Is someone still stuck at crying or giving up? <laughs> yeah. <coughs> okay, I was pretending that wasn't me too. Um, all right, so the other thing that people love to talk about where this takes you is love addiction. Who works with love addiction in this room? Quite a few people. So, I, you know, I was, as I said, I was treated for uh, psychotic anxiety at the Meadows as a kind of hospital, but I was in the addiction community because of that. And love addiction is one of Pia Melody's big things. So I was soaked in this theory. Um, I thought it had nothing to do with me until I got a bit further down the line. Then I thought, OK, this has quite a lot to do with me. Um, because if you think about the idea of love addiction, love avoidance, these are really just the, you know, the, the child who is desperate to get away and the child who's desperate to attach because they've been in that relationship we looked at before. So if that's all you know, if, th if these two things are all you know of being with another person <laughs> when you're young, your first experience of love, then why wouldn't you look for that as an adult? Um, so y when you work with love addiction, love avoidance, you're really just working <coughs> with, with this kind of thing. It's people springing apart, springing together. You can add in the frozen. We can have lots of fun with these diagrams. You just draw them and you can ask, you, you can draw them with clients and say, which one is you and which one is your mother? And you can put those two together and say, you know, if you were going to move these around on a table, where would they go? Which direction would they go? And then how would they feel when they're that far apart? It's really playful stuff and it's really simple drawings. Even I was able to draw this stuff. So it gives hope. Um, so you can bring it into that. So if you're, if you're somebody who's been working with that with a client and you're also thinking of uh, you know, discussing some of this about dysregulation, you can actually make a bridge from dysregulation to love addiction, which maybe can be helpful. Um, OK, so thinking about what the line feels like, uh, I think about you know, what the line looks like as being a third party perspective. So I'm, I'm looking at dysregulated people and how they're behaving. Of course, I can look at myself as well. 
What the line feels like is much more subjective. So this is a really a sort of first-person experience. What happens to me internally because my nervous system is dysregulated? Um, the answer is a lot. Uh, you, you hear a lot about um, co-occurring disorders, for example. So people will talk about, there's a big thing in IAPT about you've got a physical health problem and so you've got, you're then anxious and you've got a mental health problem and these two different problems kind of need to be treated, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if I just took a quick poll, physical health problems that you happen to also see in clients, has anyone got any good examples? Autoimmune disease, Autoimmune disease okay. Blood pressure. Yeah, gastrointestinal, so something like irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's, Crohn's disease. Is this ringing any bells? Okay, now all of these things you can say are actually products of a <coughs> dysregulated nervous system. Um, and it's slightly overkill, but the reason you can say that is because here's, here's the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. What's supposed to happen, what mammals normally do, is they spend about 10% of their life in the sympathetic nervous system dealing with threat, dealing with predation. And normally they either escape or die, and that's it. So they get back to doing what they're doing before pretty quickly. So a bunny rabbit will be in the field, munching lettuce, snuggling the other bunny rabbits. A fox will come, run around for three minutes, either get eaten or go back in the burrow, <laughs> return to normal, and then spend another eight hours snuggling and eating lettuce. And that's really the way the system works. Most humans, uh, you know, some, some, some of them, particularly clients you'll see in addiction recovery, are probably the other way around. If they're lucky, they spend 10% of their life in the parasympathetic. So you think, what does it do to a system that's not really set up to be on the right, if it's on the right all the time? So here's something that I wouldn't do if I was running away from a lion. I wouldn't stop for a hamburger. Okay? So my digestive system is just not interested in eating if I'm dysregulated and I'm in my sympathetic nervous system all the time. Does that make sense? So when you think about how many people present just happen to also have IBS. And we've had people come to the clinic and didn't know for two months that this client had IBS. He said, well, I never thought to mention it. It's got nothing to do with my problems here. Said, well, funny enough, it might be. Um, so you mentioned blood pressure. Well, if you're stressed and running from a line, it's a reasonably good idea to have high blood pressure. What was the other one? Autoimmune disease. Also immune disease. Yeah, so I mean, you know, it's the same system, the, the immune system. So chronic fatigue syndrome. I think after, a while, after doing this for 30 years, why wouldn't your system burn out and say, that's it, I've had enough? You know, and there's a lot of controversy about things like ME, <coughs> CFS, and there's, you know, there's people who get very angry if you say that CFS has anything to do with psychology, for example. Um, I wouldn't even say any of this has anything to do with psychology. This is just evolution, accident of evolution, and logical consequences. And you can end up in bad relationships and with CFS. And it can be logically explained to come from one root. And it's, do you call it psychology or not? Um, so anyone else want to bring up anything else they've seen in the consulting room, physical health problems, that this might help? Gyne. So conceiving, that sort of thing? Well, uh, you know, you, you can go as deep as you like into the kind of layers of psyche and even spirit and think, well, you know, where do all these things come from? But everything in the body is in balance, physically. We got your physical doctor? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So the idea of homeostasis, as I understand it, comes into play in many, many biological systems in the body. Is that right? So just think about like your blood pressure or your body temperature fluctuates up and down. And all of these systems are in some way interestingly interlinked. So if you've got one of these systems that goes haywire, then uh, you know, there's a sort of adaptation, a struggle across the whole system to keep going. So maybe or maybe not. But that's, uh, it's certainly something to think about. It's a different way of explaining the same problems. So dysregulation in mental health. Uh, we could be here all day if I asked you for examples of mental health problems. But basically, you only have to open the DSM-5 and just spend a quiet evening leafing through the 500 and something disorders that they've identified. Um, and you discover that there are 
there are all these things in mental health that are labelled with their symptoms. Right? So when I went to the Priory, finally gave in, buckled and went to the Priory, and uh, I met the medical director and he sat me down and I told him my long, boring story. Um, it's even longer and more boring than this story earlier. And it, at the end of it, he said, you've got general anxiety disorder. I said, yes, that's what I've just been telling you. Now, what's my problem? <laughs> and he said, you've got general anxiety disorder. And I said, yes, that's why I'm here. And what's wrong with me? He said, well, you've got general anxiety disorder. That's it. So uh, I wasn't terribly impressed. And he actually said, no, seriously, it really exists. I can show you it's in a book and got out the DSM-5. So, or four, or three. I don't know. Uh, so I don't think it's really very interesting medicine, if you like, um, to say to someone, they come in and say, I'm really hyper, and then sometimes I'm really depressed. I say, oh, well, so you're up and down. So yeah, I think you might be bipolar. Oh, great. Sounds like a diagnosis. It's not really an explanation, is it? It's a label. And what I think this model can help people with is an explanation. Because when you looked at that wobbly green line earlier on, shooting up when you should be in the middle is anxiety. And when that's happened for too long and you can't handle it, the system will crash because it can't stay up there forever. It's just not, like, an, like a car can't run at 100 miles an hour forever. Eventually it crashes. And that for me is depression. So these, you know, these simple things like anxiety and depression can be understood as a nervous system that's lost its calibration, lost its ability to flow in rhythm with the actual threat in their environment today. So all of us experience ups and downs, and we should go up and down with it, but if we're spiking really high and spiking really low, it's because we've lost regulation. We've lost regulation because we haven't finished dealing with some earlier threat. So it's another way of looking at mental health problems. Uh, you know, ADHD, OCD, throw some out. What do people see in the consulting room? Bipolar, um, borderline. OK, so borderline, what would be the one word, if you asked a psychiatrist, would typify a borderline? It might be, sorry? Obsessive. Yeah, it could be. But I was thinking of reactive. Mm. Does that make sense to you? That people say borderlines are really reactive. Well, if you've got an unexploded bomb stored in your system, and someone comes along with a sparkler, what are you going to do? And does that make you a bad person? Or does it make you a dysregulated nervous system that hasn't yet uh, discharged its energy? That's my view, and it's another way to talk about it helps them. So um, you said about obsessive compulsive. Dysregulation and cognition is a big part. You see that in the consulting room. Who has been with a client, and the client thinks that you are something completely different to what you are. Who's had that experience? Yeah? So tell me. Anything, any interesting, entertaining anecdote about someone who thought you were 17 years old? Or a woman? Or no, nothing that extreme? They, they only saw the, the projected error yeah. as okay. opposed to the reality of the individual. Okay. Right. So you're aware that someone's talking about you as if you're someone else. Right. Yeah. So um, why wouldn't you do that? If you're if you've got an imaginary lion <laughs> running, okay. You know, if if you've got an imaginary lion running in your system because you're dysregulated, how can you see the world for what it is? How can you not? How can you avoid not seeing it in a distorted way? So again, you might be in a situation where you're in a disagreement with a client, and you might be arguing about something that happened last week. You can't even agree on the facts of were you late for the session or did you agree you'd say this? And this is one way of looking at it, saying, look, you know, both of us have this system running. Both of us have stuff going on in our cognition which, we're, which is kind of invented, but it's really an echo from the past. It's not that it never happened. It's just it didn't happen last week between you and me, and we're mixing that in. And things also happened between you and me last week. So you know, how, do we, how do we clean that out? It's really difficult. Oh, I should get on with talking about how we clean that up. Um, so behavior. How do people behave who are dysregulated? What does it feel like in that system? What, what's it like to be stuck in a dysregulated system? So the nervous system has this brake and accelerator, which I think is anxiety and depression, which is the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, another way of dealing with dysregulation 
is just to medicate these nervous systems so that they don't spike so high on the sympathetic or fall so low on the parasympathetic. Now, just think, what, would, what do you think is a really great medication for that purpose for the sympathetic nervous system? Give me a chemical that works really well to just modulate and bring down the sympathetic nervous system when it's spiked. Well, I'm sure that's right. There's a, there's a clue on the board, though. <laughs> alcohol. <laughs> Funnily enough, by coincidence, alcohol is a terrific modulator of the sympathetic nervous system. So if, I'm, if my nervous system is dysregulated and it's always spiking high and I just want to get through, I don't know, something simple like a meal with my family, because they really trigger me. They're like big green, big green arrows. Um, well, a little bit of alcohol actually takes the edge off that. And of course, you know, it's not called a party, it's called a drinks party. Mm. Because just to get everyone together and just to relax a bit and start to be in a social engagement system, a glass of wine or something really helps. Now, a lot of you are dealing in the consulting room with the extremity of that problem. Okay? So, one other way of looking at the problem is to say, you're dysregulated, your system is a result of millions of years of mammalian evolution that's then gone awry and reasonably intelligently you found a solution that works for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes when it's all too much. And actually it's a really good solution. Chemically it's a really good solution. The problem is after the first 20 minutes or half an hour or month or 30 years of doing this there's all sorts of other problems that you're now adding in and so it's not a good solution. But in the moment it actually is a reasonably good solution doesn't work as well as a 12-step meeting. <coughs> so you want to get to that nicely self-regulated, group-regulated position. But if you're really in a crisis and you really needed your system back for 10 minutes, a shot of vodka does a pretty good job. Um, so it's a way to, again, think about reducing shame around the problem, to see it as a logical consequence of something scientific, actually. Uh, the other thing to come up might be coffee. So if you think about what goes on on this planet, think about the size of the industries of alcohol and coffee. And think about the amount of time spent by individuals thinking about when they're going to have a cup of coffee or a drink and organizing to do that together. <laughs> that is the scale of dysregulation that we face as a population. Six billion dysregulated people running around trying to get a bit lower and a bit higher and a bit lower and a bit higher. And that's just with chemicals. You know, we'll do it with relationships, we'll do it with gambling, we'll do it with sex, we'll do it with everything under the sun. So this is just one way of, you know, seeing a really specific correlation between the, f the physical problem of a nervous system that's dysregulated and the physical solution of binding in another chemical that moves it up or down. Okay, so if I haven't put you to sleep, we can talk about putting the lion to sleep. Um, so in this talk so far, what we've looked at is we've looked at the origins of dysregulation, right? Evolution, history, etc. We've then looked at really, if you think about the, the kind of timeline of a person's life, they'll become dysregulated normally in childhood, sometimes in early childhood, so the next thing that happens is their relationships change. They tend not to be running around drinking Jack Daniels at the age of two and a half, but they will maybe become anxious or clingy or disorganized or distant, right? And then what will happen is from a dysregulated nervous system and a whole bunch of slightly complicated relationships, the, the biochemistry of the body is struggling to survive and adapt through childhood, teenage years, adult life, and you could label all of that symptoms. So you'll get health symptoms, physical health symptoms, mental health symptoms, behavioral health symptoms, all of the things we've looked at. So does that kind of make sense? Yeah? Is there anyone who's lost on that journey or who thinks it's completely insane? Brilliant. It's the first time <laughs> got to that point. Um, so then you might think, well, what could we do about it? And broadly speaking, the answer is that the first the, the first answer is resources. So I don't know if there's anyone here who 
used to be not sober who became sober who would like to say ten words about what happened between the one and the other, for example. No? Transition fear to faith. Fear to faith. Okay. Amazing. So faith is a resource. Now here's an interesting thing about faith. If you're in a world running away from lions and you find faith, you find a spiritual connection, then would it make sense to you to say you've found some sense of safety? Okay. So and safety will do for the nervous system what vodka will do for the nervous system. Right? Because suddenly you're not triggered by anything. You remember that little blue bubble we drew? You imagine you've got the biggest, baddest, bluest bubble of all. And you can go anywhere and do anything, and you're in good shape. So that's you know, one of the ways that I think about faith in this model. But basically, what you've got to do first is you've got to find some resources. Because you are dysregulated, you are disorganized, and you need to get something to make it work. Oops, sorry. So to understand it, I go from one to four. Like if I'm explaining it to someone in a consultation, people will then say to me, oh, great, okay, I get it. Now what do I do about it? And I'll say, well, I've got to hand you over to the clinicians in the clinic because I'm actually not really expert at treating in this method, and they really are. And what they do is they go the completely other way around, right? So they start with, who cares about frogs and fish and your childhood and your mother? Just sit still and let's see if we can make you feel calm for five seconds in the room right now. You, know, you begin to put regulation back into the system. And so they've got some pretty specialist ways of doing that in, uh, in session, which is really somatic referencing therapies like somatic experiencing and sensory motor psychotherapy. Trying to get people, interestingly, back into the mammal part of their brain, really. It's all about, instead of tell me a story, tell me about a sensation, because the mammal is the recorder of sensation. So, so you know, resources can be things like rub a fleecy blanket in your hand. I was on an aeroplane with a woman who fainted three weeks ago, and uh, the stewardesses are running around like mad asking her annoying questions. And <laughs> I was saying, are you a bit stressed? Are you anything worried about anything? She was on her way to China. I said, yeah, I'm really worried. I've got two weeks of presentations coming out. I'm really stressed. And the stewardess was saying, oh, don't worry about that. Don't worry about work. Don't think about work. Don't think about work. Don't think about work. Work doesn't matter, does it? I said, how about instead of talking about work, we just give her a fleecy blanket to rub her hands with? And actually, in about three minutes, all the color came back to her cheeks, and she seemed much better. So I don't know, many complicated things could have been going on, but she was clearly stressed, and she ended up fainting in the loo, which is why we had this problem. So you want to get resources back on board. Um, there are many ways to do that. One of the things that I particularly advocate, and uh, it's particularly doable actually if you work with groups, is to begin to build that sense of that blue bubble around myself. So you can do that with, uh, it works on the way in, the green arrow, the number one, the boundaries. In the middle is your body, which is creating the reactivity, the nervous system. And then on the way out is your behavior. And I imagine that a lot of you work with behavior and work with boundaries. So would that be right? You know, have a show of hands for who works with boundaries. And a show of hands for people who work with, you know, here's the behavior you might choose versus the behavior you're up to. Yeah, you know, I mean, the way addiction recovery is all about trying to choose the behavior you want, isn't it? Well, it begins with that. Um, so actually getting into this system, day one, without any of this explanation or without any of this kind of technology or, or uh, thought about it, it can be as simple as trying to go from there to there. The first way to do that is to reduce the triggers. So another answer to the question I asked before of how people go from A to B is they go to a residential treatment program. Right? A lot of people get sober by submitting themselves to something where the boundaries are done for them. Does that make sense? You've got a physical building around you. You've got a whole, you've got 24-7 staff. You've got people saying, no, it's not okay for someone to talk to you like that. You don't have to say to someone, don't shout at me. Because if someone shouts at you, someone else will come and say, you, you're not allowed to treat people like that here. You're not allowed to touch without permission. Or you're not allowed to, etc. Cetera, et cetera. It's like a 12-step meeting. I can say anything. Nobody's allowed to talk about what I said. It makes me feel safe, right? So out in the street, that's not the case. 
Now, it takes quite a long time for someone to be able to hold their own boundaries. And really holding your own boundaries about saying, I notice that when that happens, my system goes haywire, so I prefer it if it doesn't happen. And it's not about telling someone else what to do, it's telling me what to do. And I'm saying, I prefer if it doesn't happen, so if everyone's shouting, I'm going over there. Or I'm asking nicely for them to stop shouting, but if they don't stop shouting, I'm going over there. Not, I'm going to try and change them to not shouting. So you know, there's a lot you can do with basic boundary work, referencing the nervous system, with the very specific idea that the boundary is what you need to do <coughs> to avoid your system getting triggered. Now, I've heard a lot of people talk about boundaries in a lot of different ways. Um, it's not always talked about in that way. Would that, would that be right? I mean, it's that basic idea, but it, it can be a confusing thing. And it can be kind of like whether it's okay to have a boundary or not, or whether it's the right boundary, but it doesn't matter. For every individual nervous system, there are things that make me go, and there are things that don't. And the things that make me go, I prefer to reduce. And that's how I justify to myself and to others and explain having a boundary. And just, you know, I can't cope with that. It's not that you're wrong, it's just I can't cope with that right now. Yeah. You can feel like you don't deserve boundaries, so you don't exactly. Have to exercise them. Exactly. Exactly. It's a It's a multi-layered circular problem. So you've got a, you know, you got the you're frozen. You're not exploding, you're frozen. How can you set a boundary when you're frozen? You can't do anything. And you know, this is why things like therapy and groups and 12 step and residential programs are so important because it can be the first time someone experiences safety but boundaries are held for them by others, by staff and by colleagues, by peers. Um, and you can begin to have the experience of, yeah, maybe it would be okay if I spoke up. And yeah, it, it is very, very difficult. Uh, I, like, you know, I like this just as another way in. This isn't the be all and end all of anything, but for, I for example, for someone like that who feels a lot of shame setting a boundary, this might be a way of saying, you know what, it's just your nervous system, it's just evolutionary baggage. And it just needs a little protecting. Like, you know, a, a man needs protecting when it goes into a nuclear reactor from a, by a radiation suit, because radiation is not good for a body. It's very similar. Um, the other thing that I think is a really important component of this, and we looked at that relationship building before, is this idea of containment. So, yeah, something's going to get through, and I'm going to get triggered. Now, what happens if I either really shut down or really explode when I'm triggered? You know, what happens to my relationships? What happens to my world? What happens to my behavior? What happens to my physical health, my mental health? Typically, not good things. Uh, you must deal a lot with relapse, for example. You know, relapse prevention is a, is a really, um, really key cornerstone, I suppose, of addiction treatment because uh, the initial goal is simply to avoid avoid the behavior, right? A lot of people will, will report that they've relapsed when they're triggered, effectively. They may not use that word, but this is what's going on. The nervous system's gone completely haywire. When that happens, the mammal and the reptile really take over, and the human system, the cognitive system that says, yes, I choose not to relapse, it, you know, you can be down to like 5%, down to 1%. You've got nothing there. And has anyone got clients who's, who say, I did relapse, but I don't really remember it. It's like I was hardly there. It's like I was watching someone else do it. That's a familiar story. Okay, so you know people are so triggered that they're that this part is just associated, and they're just in to the mammal, and the mammal needs to calm down or cope. You know, that's what's going on. So, um, you know, for example, in our group therapy in the clinic, this is very much like a twelve-step meeting. You may have a lot of energy going on when you hear something, but you're not allowed to say you're an arsehole. You're allowed to say, I got a lot of energy going on when I heard something. Right? And that's just a basic example of containment, a basic example of a boundary that keeps me from pushing everyone else away or keeps me from exploding my own boundaries. And the reason why that's important, I believe, is because I think this whole system is one system. So I don't think I can hold boundaries if I'm not... I don't think I can hold the world out if I can't hold myself in at the same time. It's like a soap bubble. You know, the moment something goes through from me to the world, I think I'm really compromising my ability to hold the world 
safe from me. Can anyone relate to that? That's a slightly subtle distinction, but I, you know, it's been my experience, is all I can say, is that when I start getting angry or out of shape, there's no way I can just say, you know, you can't, I, I can't cope with that, I'm going to stop now and let's talk about it later. It's just, it just all goes, it all goes. So, um, resourcing the nervous system can be done in those primal ways of things like s smell and touch and sensation and specialist interventions. But I, I do think that the work of the boundary work, these two boundaries I think are often talked about in addiction recovery as the same thing. You know, I have a boundary from you and I have a boundary from me. I like to call them bound a boundary and containment just so that the, you know, there's a difference between what I'm letting in and what I'm letting out. But I think if you look at the nervous system model and then you look at what it implies in relationship and in the system itself and how, it, how that toxicity can kind of wind itself up, you can see how imp why boundaries are so important. Because they are, in effect, the, the front line of recovery. Um, when I was in the meadows, it, it, people would talk about this all the time, boundaries, 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 boundaries. boundaries. And people say, well, I'm here because I eat too much oxycotton. Why do I have to talk about boundaries in my relationships all the time? Then, well, this is actually why. So the interesting thing is that if you get your system kind of in a larger sphere of containment, what happens actually is you begin to get in touch with this stuff in the middle. You can't really do that until you're stabilized and safe. Uh, and this is again why I think treatment centers offer such a great resource because you can, you know, you can be stable and safe and held and start to work on that thing in the middle which goes right the way back to the beginning of the story. Th if you accept that this is a logical chain of dominoes from dysregulation, ultimately what you want to do is you want to reach the dysregulation and discharge some of that energy so that everything's easier. But to get there, you've got to build your fortress in a way. You've got to build your walls, build your resources, build yourself. And that, that will then pop into view and you'll start to be able to work on that. And I think, when I think about people I know who've been in 12 step, they often say, oh, you know, maybe the first year and a half, two years, talk about white knuckling. People familiar with that? It's, you know, people say that they, they basically do it because they've got incredibly strong will. They choose to do it, but they can't bear it. It, it's, it doesn't feel organic. It's just a choice and they're strong enough to effectively build this boundary on purpose. But then something happens and people start to transform and change. And I think that's because you hold, you hold your system long enough, you start to be able to actually, like a mother with an infant, hold that more difficult piece inside more strongly. And then that gets a chance to resolve, uh, either calm down or discharge. But then people say, you know, then they've been in the program for sort of three, four, five years, it gets much, much easier. Is that a f am, am I making that up or does that, that feel about right? You know, those kind of timelines. And I think this is why. You know, I think that the, the initial stages of regulating the system are terribly difficult. And there's a lot going on around it. And then it starts to actually nurture itself. Because the mammal is set up to do this automatically. The, it's not some magic trick. Inside each of us is still that mammal who can do this in 90 seconds. You know, per incident. You can get your whole life done in 90 seconds. But for each uh, skirmish around the watering hole, they're back at the watering hole two, three minutes later as if nothing's happened. Um, so really what you're trying to do is you're trying to illuminate, I guess, for yourselves, for your clients, for others, this idea that you might think your problem is over here because this is how you feel and this is how the world looks and you're still running. But the genesis of the problem was over here. And actually, this, the, you know, the, the left-hand side of that board is completely fine. It's completely normal. That is, that is a perfect way to be a mammal, to run away from threat and to crash into a freeze response when the threat is totally overwhelming before your body burns out, basically. It's completely normal. Um, so the, the solution, ultimately, the, you know, the theoretical ultimate solution, is to actually take the state of the body now and reconnect it with the body memory, really, of the original threat. So, you know, there's a whole cliche in therapy about, 
oh, tell me about your mother. You know, it's like, sit down, doctor, oh, tell me about your mother. You know. And uh, in a way, it's an insight from the beginning that it all, came, it all came from somewhere earlier. But we weren't terribly good at understanding why or how that slew of problems, which get multiple different names, come from somewhere earlier. But here's a really specific way of understanding that. Yeah. Yeah. Like that holding space. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think it totally can be, but I don't think it's it's the articulative thing. Mm -hmm. um, beca because I can identify with that. Um, so I've been in recovery for like for, for ten years, but mm -hmm. I I know that my system is dis still dysregulated. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I've, I've practiced the program, mm -hmm. all that stuff, um, and I've. And I think what it's done is it's helped me learn how to cope and, s and soothe myself. If yeah, you like. great. Resor you've got resources yeah. to resource your system. Yeah, yeah. But, but equally I think there's a danger mm -hmm. that because it helps you cope, you use it and it helps. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, like, if, you know, you can get food poisoning from, say, rice, because if you reheat it, mm -hmm. the, the thing inside gets contained. Right. I didn't know that, but, but yes. thanks for <laughs> educating me. Yeah. But, if you yeah. but it gets contained, but it doesn't kill. Okay. It doesn't kill what the, right. the germ, if you like. Um, so you heat it again. Yeah. Um, so this is wha what you're saying really is this is a journey. And you no, can... I'm, no, I'm, gr I'm just going to finish okay. um, what I'm trying to say. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a bit awkward in the expression, but... Yeah. Um, If you don't complete the charge, if you yeah. don't complete that work, yeah. you're just going to effectively stay in that. Yeah. Oh, well, I've got a little program, I've got yeah. a nice place to go to, but it's not really yeah. solving the issue at core. Well, you could ask yourself, what does it look like when you've resolved every single one of your unfinished stress cycles and your system's perfectly regulated? <coughs> what does that look like? And maybe that looks like nirvana. Maybe that looks like being a guru on a mountaintop. You know, maybe that's, it's not necessary to go that far in your work in the consulting room with a client or with yourself. But I, th I sorry to interrupt you, but I think it, you know, it is a kind of journey. And you're right, people can get stuck at waypoints on the journey. And one of my goals with this work is to illuminate what I believe brings some coherent sense to all of it so that you can see where you might be on that journey and what, what might be the ne necessary to get to the next step. It um, might like not freeze them if somebody upsets you at work. Yeah. It's really difficult. I mean, I talk about these things as if it's sort of easy, but it's really difficult. You know, and here's the problem. You've got the, the you, you were there, or you can be there, and it's all very difficult, and that's where the brain has been. And what you want to get to is there. So this state where you're, uh, if you're distressed, if you, can, if you can enter into the distress in the body, this is what they call the somatic referencing therapies, and if there is a mind part of it, the mind floats back in time. So I might say to a client, what, what sensation are you aware of? Like, I've got pins and needles in my leg. I say, well, float that sensation back in time and see if it lands anywhere. And they might randomly say, oh, you know, I remember having an ice cream with my mother when I was seven. And suddenly, this happens. That everything just suddenly feels more normal. And then they say, it's really weird. Suddenly I'm just not bothered about that woman at work anymore or the ex-boyfriend or... I mean, I've seen this, I've seen someone go from reporting 9 out of 10 in distress about, about her ex-boyfriend to 2 out of 10 in 5, 10 minutes of doing that. And she said she'd been like that all weekend and was getting to the point where she just couldn't take it anymore. And that's why, because you know, the, that's a really uncomfortable place to be and your brain's going haywire with the lion. And that's... Um, that's where you want to be. That, that, if you're there, the body will discharge and everything will take care of itself and you'll be fine. So that is the summary that I would give you is that that's the problem, that's the solution, and that is a building block in the consulting room for working with the ideas of boundaries and relationship and addiction and containment and even... Um, attachment styles. You know, th these things come into a lot of all of your work, but in different ways from different directions. What I'm trying to do is give you a way to just speak to them so that they can relate to each other in fairly plain language, simple, 
simple style. And effectively, what you're, what you're trying to do is undo the fall in the Garden of Eden. You're taking that moment of self-awareness where someone starts to get all concerned about what's going on for themselves and say, look, just put that to one side. Let's let the mammal get on with it. And you reverse the effect of dysregulation, put regulation back into the system. So we've got about three minutes left for questions. <coughs> I thought we'd have more. I apologize. Um, is there anything that you want? Yeah, at the back. Yeah. I meet a lot of clients that absolutely refuses to do group work. Yeah. Well, we have a lot of clients that refuse to do group work as well. Um, when they're in the residential clinic, they don't get much choice. Uh, they also refuse to share a room. Again, they don't get much choice. <coughs> yeah, we're, we're trying to build relationality all the time because that's a great tonic for the nervous system and learning that relationships are possible. In our outpatient program, we offer groups and individuals, and everyone just wants individuals that doesn't want to go to the group. So we ended up bribing people to go to group because we saw the best outcomes for people who did both. And we said, look, you can book 10 sessions at a discount and have free groups. <laughs> and people are like, well, now I'm paying for a group I don't want. I said, yeah, you are. Maybe you should go. And it, it, it's definitely the case that people who share rooms in the clinic, people who go to a group outpatient, if you know, you just look at the theory. You can see why it, it's tough to regulate your system alone. I mean, you can't go. You can go to a twelve-step meeting on your own. It's not going to work, is it? So it, it is about building a sense of uh, re learning how to redo relationship because you're learning how to redo your own system. Yeah. So that's helpful. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm a charming manipulative, so it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I've got a lot of pre-verbal trauma, and I recovered. So I think that um, I think I think people end up unable to cope sometimes when uh, there isn't there isn't a kind of early foundation. Like if you think about those bubbles, that blue bubble, it's really an echo of the mother and the red bubble. You know, these are all echoes of uh, in a in a perfect childhood. All that's built through the mother metabolizing the problem and you just, it, it kind of resonates into the system of the infant up to the age of three and five and so on. So the earlier the problem, the less structure you have to build your scaffolding on. And so when, you know, when the wind blows, as it did in my case, there's just nothing there. Um, and if I hadn't done this work in a residential program, I probably wouldn't have been able to do it because I needed that body, you know, that big body of 12 people of a building, a, a womb-like building. I needed that because I couldn't, I couldn't kind of infer or invent or resonate that for myself because I'd never known it. Well, I maybe knew it when I was you know, a baby, but I didn't, I didn't have it enough. So yeah, the great thing is you don't have to have any narrative with this work. You can just go in and let the body work. You don't, I mean, sometimes you don't even have to talk about <coughs> story. People say you can get through traumas without even knowing what they are. Um, I think it's easier when it all comes together. But I've got that kind of mind. You know, I like to see how things come together. So for me in treatment, I really need to make sense of things to calm down that maniac top part of the mind. But other people, not always like that. Some people are just much more naturally somatic. Okay. Oh, one more quick question. Yeah. Yeah. And my experience with a lot of my patients is that you know, we tell them we discuss what their triggers are and we understand that they're like you know what to avoid, what kind of situations, what kind of people they do. Yeah. And in real life, those triggers are constantly there. Yeah. That's absolutely what it's for.
Sure. Well, the, the, so there's two possible triggers in that situation. There's being in the bar, which is an external trigger, and then there's the what you're telling yourself about being in a bar, which can be an internal trigger. So you might need a boundary from either or both. So you might need to not go to bars, or you might need to change your thinking about being in bars. Either way, you can help. But the, the, I'll give you the, the short answer is, check in with your body. If your body feels like it's going, then this situation is not okay for you and you have to change something. And you don't have to justify that. It doesn't have to make sense. And it can be a change internally or it can be a change externally. The thing about boundaries is you always know you need a boundary if you're noticing yourself getting dysregulated. And that's it. And the only way to find that out is to ask your body. You can actually say, does this feel okay for me in here? If it doesn't, go away. Do something else. Speaking of going away and doing something else, <laughs> you are all released. Thank you so much for being here.